Here we go. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first class of our Musser Masterclass series. Um, so we're going to talk about Musser. And the word Musser, you'll hear a lot. You'll hear a lot of conversation about the word Musser. And I want to give you my definition to what Musser means, what that word means. But I can't get to that till I give a little bit of an introduction. So the first thing you need to know, we all need to know, is that I'm not teaching you anything. I'm not here to lecture you. We are here on a journey. It's my journey. And I'm hopefully going to share my journey with all of you. Because when we're talking about traits, about anger, about kindness, about jealousy, about you know all of the incredible traits that hopefully you all received in the email. If you didn't, then please let me know. But alacrity, appre appreciation, caring, cleanliness, faith, all of these incredible traits, right? We all measure at a different place with these traits. Some of us are perfect. Some of us may be so weak in that trait, in any of these specific traits, the good and the, and the not so good, and the not so good traits. So the first thing I want you to know is that I am not a perfect person. I aspire to be perfect. I want to be perfect. I try every day to be perfect, but I'm not. So I am not here to tell you this is the way to do it because trust me, I'm the pro. No, I'm not the pro. And what, what I would like to happen here is for my growth to be shared with everyone else. Hopefully, if I'm worthy of growing, hopefully it'll shower onto everyone else. and We'll all be able to grow together. And this won't be a journey just of one man, but rather a, a journey of an entire community. Does everybody hear me? Thumbs up. Anna, you hear me? Lauren, you hear me? Okay, so whoever that was, you might want to just fix your, your uh, speaker. Um, okay, the next thing I would like to share with you is that, um, you know, some of you may come from different congregations, from different backgrounds. Uh, I want to just share and just get this so that you have it clear from the beginning. Okay, I am a Torah observant Jew, and many of you may be members at a Reformed temple, conservative, Orthodox, Reconstructionist. I love every Jew, and I want you to know that in my view, there is no Reformed Jew there's no conservative Jew, there's no Reconstructionist, no Orthodox, there is no type of Jew, except two types of Jews. There is a growing Jew and there's a stagnant Jew. And I have met people who are not members of any synagogue whatsoever that are growing Jews. I've met people who have been part of an Orthodox synagogue their entire life that are stagnant Jews. I've met from every, every uh, you know, demographic, I've met people who are unique and special. But they all fall into one of these two categories, either be a growing Jew or a stagnant Jew. My hope is that I myself always be a growing Jew and that hopefully each and every one of us in our journey through life, that we are constantly growing Jews. So it doesn't make a difference where your membership is. It's nonsense. It's irrelevant. It'll never come up in any of these classes. It'll never come up in this course. Anyone's affiliation, it's irrelevant. OK, we're all brothers. We're all sisters. We're all united as one in the journey of growth. The next thing I would like to share is that we have a, a, a bunch of papers that were emailed out. If you didn't receive it, please let me know after class. Put your comments in the chat of your email address if you have not received any of these documents. I just want to go through them so you'll know what they are. So the first two documents are a Musser worksheet if you receive the Musser worksheet, this is a worksheet that you can use after each week's class. And each week we're going to discuss a different trait. It's called a midah. A midah is a trait. And you'll write down on the top after each class, you'll write down the midah that we discussed that week, that week, the trait that we discussed that week. And then what's very important is that we get definitions clear. What is the definition of the trait, for example, of... Kindness. Now, we have 64 people online. We have eight people here in the room. If I asked what is the definition of kindness, I guarantee you I would get 72 different definitions for that one word of kindness because everyone has a different experience with kindness. But in order to work on the trait, we have to really crystallize the idea of the trait. What is, God, what is God's trait of kindness? When we talk about Abraham as being our patriarch, who was stellar in his acts of kindness 
What is real kindness? And that's what we're going to do in each one of these weeks coming, coming up. We're going to discuss traits, different traits, but we're first going to define the trait so we know what it is. I remember we were once, uh, this is many, many, probably 10 or 11 years ago, um, we were giving a class, a series of classes in one of the congregations in our community here in Houston. And we were talking about, we, we were talking about a certain trait. And as we were finishing the class, um, I announced next week, we're going to be talking about the trait of patience. So one of the women in the class, a very special woman, and she, she, she raises her hand. She says, Rabbi, I don't think I'll be coming next week because I'm a very patient person and I really don't need to work on my patience that much. And I probably won't be here. I said, you know, what's your definition of patience? What does patience even mean? And so she said, you know what? Okay, maybe I'll come. So she came the following week. And after that class, she said, Rabbi, I need to apologize in front of the whole class. She says, I was so arrogant when I walked out of the class. I said, oh, I'm patient. I don't need to come to that class. And she said, as I was pulling out of the parking lot, the car in front of me wasn't moving fast enough. So I honked my horn and I realized how impatient I am. I said, I better, be, I better come back to that class. The, the, the thing is like this, is that what is these Musar traits? These are the traits of who we are, the character, our, our very essence. And many, many times they're buried deep down within our subconscious and we don't even know they exist. Which is why the study of Musa is so important so that we can identify them, recognize them, and then hopefully turn them around and make them as perfect as can be. We're going to get into many of the details of this. It's a long journey. The, the journey of Musa is a never-ending journey, just like the study of Torah never ends. There are no graduates to Torah. There's no degrees in Torah. It's just never ending uh, uh, sea of knowledge. All right. The second part of this document is a introspection or a cheshbon hanefesh, which is an opportunity if let's say we're talking about the trait of kindness for every person privately to, to inspect themselves. Where am I holding with this trait? Am I weak at this trait? Am I perfect in this trait? And Again, this is only for ourselves, for our own. It's, it says on top, private, right? So that we know it's not for anybody. You're not, um, you don't have to hand this in. There's no homework. But the idea is we want to grow. And if we're not going to be able to identify where we are holding with our own traits, it's going to be very hard to improve in any area. The next is the practical part, and that is what would I like to accomplish with the work in this trait? And with kindness, just the example that we've given, the kindness, the trait of kindness, uh, well, do I want to become a volunteer? What do I want to do? What do I want to accomplish with my trait of kindness? Do I want to reach perfection? In what way do I want to reach perfection? Do I want to always be the person who says yes when someone needs something? What exactly do I want to accomplish when it comes to the trait of kindness? All right. And then a very important question. What tools do I already possess that can immediately be employed to help affect a small measure of change with this trait? So many times we may not be able to completely change something. We may not be able to turn around 180, 180 degrees and go in the opposite direction. But perhaps I have some quality, some virtues, some traits that just with a little modification, I can become more kind. With a little bit of an adjustment, we can change our traits. So that's a very important thing for each person to, to identify. And then the last part of, of the worksheet is Kabbalah, which is accepting upon myself. For example, if the trait is kindness. So let's say I accept upon myself that twice a day I should think about doing an act of kindness for someone else. Right? So that's, and you can write it down, the midah of kindness in the following way, three times a day, four times, ten times. My recommendation is very small. Very, very small changes. We're going to talk about how important small changes are. It's critically important. Okay. Page number two is a daily journal. The daily journal gives you an opportunity to mark every day um, the one that, okay, which is, it should be start from Tuesday. What does it say on yours? It says Sunday? Yeah, it should start from Tuesday. So that would be for tomorrow. 
uh, on my copy on my computer, it said Tuesday, but somehow here it says Sunday. So, so tomorrow you would journal how was your acceptance, this trait, this Kabbalah that you made on the previous page, how did it actually pan out? Were you able to focus on it? Were you able to succeed in that challenge? And then mark every single day. Now, what's the importance of, of journaling? The per importance of journaling is that then it comes into your consciousness. What we want to do is be conscious living people who at every moment are attentive to our traits and to our um, and to our environment and to our growth. Okay, so that is the journaling. That's page number two. Page number three is who am I? Now, none of these need to be done today during class. This is for after, but this is just giving us a tool so that we can learn and identify the unique person that each of us are. There are no two people on planet Earth who are the same. None. Can you imagine, Susan? There are no two people on planet Earth who are the same. We're all unique. What's unique about me? This sheet of paper can show you what's unique about you. Because these are different traits. And every single person on this entire class, okay, all of us, every single one of us, we are going to have a different setup, a different makeup of these traits. No two are going to be the same. I guarantee it. Even if you mark all perfect. Okay, <laughs> right? Or all week. I guarantee you, no, no, and that's the uniqueness of humanity is that every single human being is different. Now, these 13 traits are just random traits that I selected. I picked them out of a hat, okay? I picked 13 positive, 13 negative traits. I will also tell you that um, I'm going to send you, God willing, this week, I will send you a document you probably can't see it from your computers, but this is a list of 221 positive traits and 330 negative traits. Okay, just to give you an idea, this is from the book of Rabbi Zelik Pliskin. I've added a few more to his list, but this is just to give you an idea. I just picked 13 positive traits and 13 negative traits for the Who Am I worksheet so that we can hopefully get an idea of who we are. Okay, the rest I'll leave for the towards the later later part of the class. Let's get started. All right, my dear friends, buckle up. Okay, God created Adam. God created an amazing world, created Adam and Eve. And God, Torah tells us, God blew into the nostrils of Adam a living soul. Vayipach be'apav nishmat chayim. God blew into the nostrils of Adam a living soul. Our sages tell us, what is that soul? Those are the traits of God. It also is the battery that keeps us alive. But it's the soul, the soul when God blew into, we have a peace, so to speak. Our Hasidic masters say that there is a chelek eloka mimal. There is a peace, a particle, so to speak, of God within us. Now, God doesn't have pieces. God doesn't have a form. But in essence, what was in this world before creation? What was in this world before creation? God. Only God. So everything that is created is a piece of God, so to speak. It's a creation of God. In everything that exists, including this magnificent microphone, is a piece of godliness. Because everything that was created was created by God. So now, God putting, imbuing us with those character traits is giving us part of his traits, so to speak. Now, we know, we, we say in our prayers, the 13 attributes of God, because God is perfect in all of his traits. We aspire to be perfect. Our goal, the task of Adam is to be perfect. That is the goal. Throughout our life, we will have a journey. We will have challenges. We will have one after another after another come before us, stumbling blocks before us to perfect us in our traits. So there's two ways to live life. We can live life alert, awake, conscious, 
and recognizing that everything that happens around me is a message, or I can just close the shutters and prefer not to see anything. Right? It's like the red pill and the blue pill. Right? We, it's our decision. We can, we can decide if we're going to live a world where everything is a miracle, where everything is a message, everything is a, is a, a hand-picked lesson for us to learn from the Almighty, or we want to live in oblivion. Adam, very interestingly, gave names to all the animals. He gave names to all the animals. And the, and the commentaries talk about how all the animals of the world came to one place four times in history. The first time was when Adam gave names. They all came. Sudden, suddenly the horses, they came. And Adam had to learn their nature. And he gave them a name that represents their nature. The camels came. And they said, oh, give us a name. He learned about their nature and gave them a name. I'll just tell you briefly. I'll tell you a few examples. Okay. Anybody here familiar with a dog? Everyone's familiar with dogs. Everyone loves dogs. Man's best friend, right? Why? Why? Because, because it's all heart. It's all heart. It's an amazing creature. A dog is all heart. Do you know what's unique? You know, men and women are different. I think we'd, most of us would agree that we're, we're a little bit different. A little bit. A little bit different, right? The... The, the interesting thing is that if a man were to tell his wife, a day after they get married, she's so excited, her husband comes home, she opens up the door to greet him, and he's like, can you not bother me? I had a rough day at work. I want to watch my sports and leave me alone. I can guarantee you the next day she won't greet him at the door the same way. Is that correct? That's the way most of us are, human beings. As emotional as we may be, it doesn't make a difference. Right? We won't go for an experience that's painful a second time. Why? Because we have intellect. And as emotional as we may be, our intellect tells us that was painful. But what happens, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, where people say, oh, bad dog, bad dog. And they shoot the dog away. And what happens a minute later? It comes right back wagging its tail. Why? What happened? Didn't, didn't he learn that it's a painful experience? I'm not in the mood right now. I want to watch my sports. Stop bothering me. I just said bad dog. Leave me alone. It comes right back. Why? Because although a dog has intellect, it's controlled completely by his emotion. Completely by his emotion. Kelev is the name of a dog, which is kol lev, all heart. It's all emotion. It's only controlled by its emotion, which is a little bit of a sad, a sad, uh, you know, if this is what humanity is, that that's our best friend, only a dog who is so forgiving who is only controlled by emotion, that's the only thing we can get along with, that's a big problem. We have to be accountable, right, to, to a relationship that's beyond just, you know, okay. I'll give you another example. We mentioned a, a camel, right? What's the unique characteristic of a camel? It's humps, right? It has these big humps. What's unique? Why, why does a camel have those humps? So our sages teach us an incredible thing, and it's in the name, in the Hebrew name is everything. Our sages teach us an incredible thing. A, a camel wants to be independent. It doesn't want to come back to its master every five minutes. I'm thirsty. Can you give me another drink? I'm thirsty. Give me more to drink. He's going to have to go through the entire desert. And he doesn't want to be asking. He wants to be independent. So he fills up his humps with water so that he can go the entire journey without having to ask again and again, without having to be dependent on his master. Very important. It says about Abraham that when Isaac 
was old enough, it says, Biyom Higamel et Yitzchak, the day that he weaned Isaac. The same word, Higamel, is the word Gamal. Gamal is a camel, weaned to be independent. Now we talk about the trait of Gimilut Chasadim, of loving kindness. What does kindness really mean? What it really means is to make someone be independent. Teach someone how to fish instead of giving them fish. Right? You give them fish, they have fish for they have dinner for one day. You teach them how to fish, they have dinner every night. It's to make them independent because someone doesn't have to come every night and knock on your door, please help me, I need food for I need money for dinner. Please help me, I need money for dinner. No. Give them a job. Give them a give them a a, a, a sense of pride, a dignity. Get them earn their own income. They'll feel happy. They'll feel they'll feel enriched by it. That is the trick. When we talk about gamal, we talk about gemilut chasadim. We talk he gamel. All of these things to win, to be a, a camel, and to do acts of kindness are all interlinked. It's brilliant. This is the wisdom that Adam had to have the foresight. He needed to understand each animal to see their nature, to see their their unique qualities and to give them a name that defined their essence. Okay? We're good. Yeah, okay. Lauren, I'm counting on you. Okay, great. All right, so now what is Adam? What is the word Adam? Adam, mankind, all of us. So we know that the Torah says, God named Adam, Adam. Why? Because he was taken from the Adama, from the earth. What? He's taken from the earth, so that's... Oh, uh, one second. Adam is going through all of these hardships to try to figure out the nature of every animal for us to just give Adam the name. Why? Because he was taken from the earth. Oh, that, that, that rhymes. That, that, right? that can't be the reason why he's given that name. Our sages tell us a very important thing. And this is a, the most important part of all of Musar study. We are called Adam because of Adame. Adame means to emulate. We are here in this world as human beings to emulate God. We are here on a mission to emulate the ways of Hashem. That is our goal. That is our objective. Every human being that was created since Adam and Eve is here on the same exact mission to emulate God. Be as godly as you can be. And there are many animals we can talk about. We can give many examples. But the idea behind it all is that we, Adam, is like Adama. You know, Adama, the earth, right? We came from the earth. But just like Adama, if you don't plant things, if you don't sow, if you don't harvest, nothing's going to grow. So too with human beings, if we don't educate ourselves, if we don't learn, if we don't practice, if we don't have trial and error, we're not going to grow. In order for us to grow, we need to act like the earth, where we need to take one step at a time, planting and growing and planting and growing. And sometimes, you know what? Sometimes we're going to fail along the way. That's part of our growth. That's part of our growth. I, I can guarantee you that if we went through everyone on this chat, we'd find that everyone had an experience in their life where they thought everything was over. That's it. My life is coming. Everything is failing. All the doors are closing in front of me. I can't believe it. My life is just dark. To later see that it was actually the beginning of the greatest part of their life. Everyone's nodding their heads here, right? It's an amazing experience that we have to realize that we are like the Adama. Constantly need to work on ourselves. We need to compare, we need to not compare, we need to emulate God in every way, in every possible way. It's a very important thing, you know, we say in Proverbs, an amazing verse, Hachzek b'musar al teref. Hold on to Musar, to the Musar study, to work on oneself. Don't let go. Notzra ki Treasure that work, 
because that's your life. The Gaon of Vilna says an amazing thing. He says, our purpose in this world is to never stop working on our traits. It doesn't end. You don't say, oh, finally, I'm in, I'm in Cancun. Nobody, I can yell and scream at whoever I want. You know, I don't have to have manners. I don't have to have be, be kind. I don't need to be, you know. Obviously, we know that that wouldn't be the case. Just because you're in a different place where no one knows you doesn't mean that your character traits, that your essence changes. Your essence doesn't change. Wherever you are in every circumstance in life, we need to be able to work on ourselves. And God is constantly changing this for us. Where, you know, you've ever been an employer? How are your traits then? You've been an employee? How are your traits then? We have you ever been at the, you know, the, the number one at the food chain and the one number 10 on the food chain? You have, you, you, we're many times in different situations. Sometimes we're the leader. Sometimes we're not the leader. Sometimes we're the parent. Sometimes we're the neighbor. How am I going to act to my neighbor's child? When I'm the parent, I'm like, why don't they mind their business? Now it's me. Now I'm the neighbor, right? Maybe I should mind that, my business. But the idea is that we'll always be on different sides of the coin. And it's very important to realize that each one is a different test. It's a test. Life is a test. It's like one, one of the things that I, I love to, to, to say about marriage is that marriage is a workshop in character development. Anybody who's been married for 20 minutes will tell you that it's not a picnic. It's a place to work on yourself. It's a place to grow in your relationship, mainly by working on oneself. That's the goal. Okay. So it's not just a nice thing to work on one's traits. It really is life. This is the essence of who we are. So I want to give you my definition. I told you earlier, I will give you my own personal definition of what Musar is. My definition of Musar is maximizing every aspect of you. Of you, of each and every person. Maximizing every aspect of you. That is Musar. And we will see it come together in, 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 in a plethora of different uh, um, ways. We will see so many different dynamic traits. We all have traits that could be hidden. We mentioned this previously, that could be hidden within us. If we don't explore our God-given traits, they could remain hidden and our potential unmaximized and unactualized. Right? We have to be so attentive to our traits because it's very easy for someone who has a propensity towards anger to just lash out and not even realize that they lashed out. Right? You ever see someone who has a bad temper and you say, whoa, whoa. You're like, what? I was, I was just, everything's fine. Right? Are you crazy? <laughs> right? What, what did you see here? But it's very hard because we don't see ourselves. We don't realize how we sound or how we how we how we seem to others. That's why it's very important. We'll see in the process of Musar study, it's important to have a good friend. It's important to have someone who can be a mirror to you, who can tell you, because we all have blind spots. Right? We all have blind spots. Like right behind me, right here, there are many books on the shelves. Now, what's if, God forbid, one of those shelves were about to fall down and hit me on the head? So hopefully someone here, all right, or online or in the, in the classroom here will say, oh, oh, watch yourself because you're going to be about to get hit. It's because you care about me, hopefully, right? And you don't want me to get hit and hurt by something. We all have blind spots. And sometimes we can hit another car, with, right, and in a vehicle, we all have blind spots. Even if you have that little, uh, that little light that turns on, that little notification in your mirror that tells you there's something in your blind spot, but it's important for you to, to be able to notice that there is something there. We all have blind spots. Every single one of us has a blind spot. And that's part of what we want to accomplish here is let's see what's in our blind spot. What are my weaknesses? 
The goal of Musr is not to say that you're terrible. Oh, I'm so bad. You know, and you list off all of, all of your negative traits and you go up and down the list. You see, uh, uh, what is it, 330 negative traits and you're like, oh, he gavalt, right? What am I going to do, right? Look at me, I'm so terrible. You look at the list here of uh, aggression, anger, arrogance, dishonesty, envy, flattery, hatred, like, oh, what am I going to do? That the goal is not to, to, to make us depressed. Uh, it's on, on the contrary. It's to empower us, to give us the opportunity to work on perfecting each and every one of those traits. And God willing, through the process of this course, we're going to hopefully be able to harness those tools, get them and, and, and work through it. Now, I will tell you again, you know, I want to share with you my great grandfather. Rabbi Shlomo Walby's father-in-law worked on a single trait of greeting every person with a smile for two years. For two years, he worked on this one trait. Can you imagine working on one trait? Just think about it for a second, okay? You're, you're preparing Thanksgiving Eve, Thanksgiving Eve, right? You're preparing, you have family coming in, you have your children coming in from college, you have, you know, uh, your, your cousins are coming in, and you're busy cooking in the kitchen. And your neighbor comes over and wants to schmooze. It's like the worst time. It's like everything is like schmoozing now. What are you going to schmooze now? Now it's like, guess what? Greeting every person with a smile, even then. Yeah. What's that? You can put them to work. Yeah, <laughs> put them to work. But you, we all understand that that if you if we really want to work on perfection of a trait, it's going to take a tremendous amount of work, much more than the one week we talk about each trait, or perhaps two weeks. It, you know, it's a hachzek b'musar al teref. Never stop. Never leave. Go of the work of Musa, because this, as as a whole, will take a lifetime to perfect all of us. Okay, so we see an unbelievable thing that the 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 first thing we need to do is to take stock of an inventory of our own traits of me. Who am I? Right? You know, my grandfather was known that in his yeshiva he would talk to the students about. Musar study about self-identity, character. And he would guide the students to go walk in the evening when it was quiet, there weren't cars on the streets, go walk and alone. Go walk alone with yourself and just get to know yourself. My grandfather said, and I heard this many times from him, how one student came back frightened. He said he was white like a paper, right? He was white like a goat. And he opens up the door. My grand, he knocks at my grandfather's door. My grandfather opens up. He says, what's the matter? He says, I went on a walk like you, like you guided me. And I met someone I've never met before. It was terrifying. It was frightening. He said, who did you meet? Did he, did he threaten you? Did he mug you? Did he? he says, no, no, it was me. He says, my entire life, I've been walking around giving off an impression that I'm someone else. And my whole life I've been following a persona that wasn't real. And now I realize that the true me is a totally different person. It's a really frightening thing. You know, if we don't know who we really are, it, it could be very frightening. I want you to know something is that there is a gift there's a gift that the commentaries talk about throughout the ages that God has embedded in each and every one of us. Now, if you take the fourth sheet that I gave you earlier, you'll see it's a very interesting diamond that you have. It looks like this. It's a diamond shaped, uh, right? A diamond shape with a line on top, with a square, a square on, a rectangle on top, and a rectangle on bottom, and five rows on each side of the upper half of the of the uh, diamond and five rows on each side 
of the lower half. So the top half are your positive traits. And my grandfather says in his book, in his legendary work, that each and every one of us, I told you, you have a special gift. You know what the, what the special gift is? We have one trait on top of your diamond that is absolutely perfect. We all have a single trait which is absolutely perfect. We said that God gave us traits. We got par parts of it. We got pieces of it. Not perfection, except for one trait. One trait. One trait we have perfect, and we have one trait which is our weakest, I would say, imperfect trait. So what's the question? I ready I ready to read your mind, Lauren. Right? You're, you, you're saying, okay, what's that trait? Right? Just tell me what that trait is. That, I can't tell you. <laughs> because every person has a different trait. <laughs> and only you, and only you know what that trait is. And only you can, in fact, investigate what that trait is. Now, if you're married, your wife can help you. <laughs> right? Your wife can help you because that is, the, women have an intuition. Much stronger than men do. Sorry, guys. Yeah, but they don't so, tell us that's so, positive. That's so, no, so it's very important. It's very, very important for us to identify what married. what this positive what this positive trait is, because this trait is going to help us perfect all of these traits. Because let's say someone's we brought the the, the the trait of kindness, right? So let's say your perfect trait is kindness. You can use kindness to help you with your patience. You can use kindness to help you with any of your other traits, like happiness, right? You can attribute, you can add that trait of kindness to all of your other positive traits. And that will also help with your negative traits. It'll help you bring them to their perfection and to remove them. So it's very important to identify who we are. And it could be feeling like insurmountable. It's like, where do I start? What, what do I do? I, how do I get there? But this is the journey. We're on this journey together. And I look forward to, uh, to, to, uh, to this journey. It's, it's, it's quite an experience. But I there's something very important that we saw a couple of weeks ago in the Torah portion. We know that Jacob passed away. And before he passed away, he gave blessings to all of his children, except for two. Two children, he didn't give them a blessing. That's Ru, uh, that's Shimon, Simeon, and Levi, right? These two brothers, the tribes, did not get a blessing, but rather he reprimanded them, and he tore them apart, and he tells them, "You guys used violence. You guys." You, got... you wonder, like, to all the other brothers. Jacob is giving a beautiful blessing, wishing them with this and wishing them with that. And it is like, you know, such kindness. And here, Ruv, Shimon and Levi, they're getting beat up. They're getting beat up. Say, so just tell us something amazing. That they, in fact, got the greatest gift of all the brothers. Because what is a blessing? If I were to give you a blessing, say, oh, you should be so successful. In your business, right? You should be, you know, the challenge that you're facing in life should be cleared up and all taken care of. God should help you, in a, right? Does that mean that it's going to happen? No. Is it in your hands to make it happen? Probably not. It's putting a goodwill out there, asking God for that goodwill. And is it going to necessarily come to fruition? If God decides that you deserve it, you'll deserve it. You'll get it. If he decides that you don't deserve it, you won't get it. But what happens if I tell you one of your traits? That is something that is in your hand that you're able to change by yourself. That is something that you can work on. It's right there. The greatest gift that Jacob could have given Shimon and Levi, the brothers, he told them their flaws. He told them about their self-identity. He opened up a window to them that was closed. He gave, shed light into what the essence of who they were. What was the essence of who they were? That does not mean, by the way, 
that you go back to school or you go back to, to your synagogue or to your to your club with all your friends and you tell them, oh, just by the way, I wanted to tell you, your negative trait is this and your negative trait. And you should thank me for that because it's the greatest gift, right? Because as we will talk about, we'll talk about love and rebuke. It's one of the very, very important traits is that even though it's a commandment in the Torah, do you know that it's a commandment in the Torah in Leviticus? It says that you have to reprimand your fellow. If you see someone doing something, you have to tell them. If you see someone who is failing in a specific area, you want to help them. You have to tell them. But there's a precondition. The precondition is that it's not done out of anger. It's not done out of hatred. And it's not done out of anything other than love. And even then, our sages tell us a very important rule. The Talmud. The Talmud says that just like there is a mitzvah to reprimand someone who will listen, there is a mitzvah not to reprimand someone and not to give critique to someone who will not listen. That means if you know that they're going to listen and they're going to accept your reprimand, A1. If you know that they will not, you're not allowed to say a word. So what's the obvious question? Well, how am I supposed to know? How am I to know if someone's going to accept or not? Well, then you better get moving on getting to know them better. If we don't know them well enough, we have no business walking over to strangers and telling them, Oh, you know, uh, that's not the way you should educate your child. <laughs> you should try uh, this technique or that technique. Or you shouldn't put... Yeah, people are filled with advice and people with filled with telling you what to do, right? Our sages teach us that it's very important before we reprimand someone else, before we give guidance to someone else, we have to make sure there are a bunch of preconditions. Make sure it's out of total love and make sure that you know that they're going to accept it. You have to say it in a way that's really, really a beautiful and loving way. And not just because you're upset, you got to let this out. Okay, I'm done. I've heard so many people tell me this over the years. They're like, that's it, Rabbi. I just can't hold it anymore. I have to say something, right? Well, are you saying it for yourself or are you saying it for them? If you really love that person, right, you won't say anything. I'll actually share with you a story, okay? Um, there's a story. Um, this happened, happened probably uh, 13 years ago maybe more, maybe less. I don't remember. Uh, it was a long time. It was at least more than a, more than a decade ago. And I, um, something happened that I was very, very embarrassed by what someone did. And I was, I was extremely embarrassed, like to the point where I was like, I, I had to leave the room. I was so embarrassed. And I remember when I, when I walked out, I said to myself, I am not going to say a word for two weeks. That's how upset I was. I'm not saying a word about the story for two weeks. I walked out. I put on my poker face. I came out and everything's fine. I didn't say anything. Two weeks later, the opportunity came where I was able to have a very pleasant time with this person and then said, you know, there's something that happened that you probably didn't even realize happened. But I was very, very embarrassed. Oh, no, tell me. No, tell me, please. Right. And I was able to share that information. And the person was genuinely sorry that this ever happened. Now, many times, if we don't take that time, if we don't separate between when something happens to us and we're all worked up and responding to it, we know what happens. It's World War Three. And if that's a spouse, it's World War IV, right? It is. It is. It becomes a a a a, a terrible uh, clash. How can you do this? You embarrass me. How can I? Right? And it becomes. Instead, there's no more emotion involved. It's so. It's a week or two later. We can say it after we thought it through. After we were we're calm. We're patient. We were able to say it and use the right words to explain and to teach. Okay, so we understand that the, there's many ways in which we can learn. In fact, the, uh, the Mishnah says that if you criticize a wise person, they will love you for it. Why? Because a wise person always wants wisdom. 
always wants insight. And even if you don't put it on a silver platter and you don't decorate it and make it all nice, they will always appreciate your, your, your taking the time to share with them your perspective and to share with them your insight. It's very important that if you do have someone in your life that you could share this information with or that they can share information about you, about your character, about your essence, to, to be open, not in the sense of like, just hurt me, throw darts at me, and it's not going to, no. is to be open in the sense that if we want to get a grasp of who we really are and to get a picture so that we can work on perfecting our traits, we're get, we have to be, um, I don't want to say vulnerable, but we have to be accepting to hear another perspective. To hear another perspective. Because we, I only see right now about, if there's any op op ophthalmologists there, or up, all right, um, I see about 150 degrees right here, okay? That's what I see. Everything else is in my, you know, in this is my peripheral vision. I see both my hands right now, and that's it, okay? I can't see beyond them. Right now, I don't see them anymore, right? So there's a lot the 360 degrees around us that we don't see. I only see what my eyes show me. And even then, it's only what I'm focused on. Right? They've done studies of people looking at a basketball. They say, you know, look, and they have a beer running through the through the, the court, the basketball court. And they say, what did you see? How many times did he score that basket? And you're busy counting that. And you don't realize there's a beer running right across the screen because you're so focused on that. Many times we're focused on what we see, but we don't we don't have the full dimension of our character. Others around us see everything that's around us. And they can share with us a perspective that perhaps we don't have in understanding ourselves. Now that does not mean that that look, if 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 we were courageous, we'd go, so tell me, what do you think is my greatest trait? And you start writing it down. What do you think is my worst trait? Oh, yeah, right? So it, it could be quite an experience to, to open ourselves up like that. But let's, let's, um, start, let's start by starting, by identifying our own traits, right? I gave this list on, on page number three so that we have just something to work with till next week when we start another another trait to just work on these traits and think about it it's, it's not going to take a, a it's not a 10 second it's not a quiz like oh you know it's like think through it what what does this trait really mean to me and on the bottom if you notice on the bottom of this page it says the date because at the end of this 10 weeks you're going to do this again and then you'll see the difference of how it looks now and how it'll look then, right? We are exceptional beings that God created. Each and every human being is unique and special. And we have so much potential. We have so much opportunity. And that's the beauty of life. Life is just one amazing um, opportunity for growth. Every challenge we have is custom made for us to accomplish and achieve that greatness. So I want to talk a little bit more about what it means to have Musa in our lives. So let's, I want to give an example, and I, I've shared this in the past in, in different classes, but, you know, there's an incredible Midrash. The Midrash says the following. Abraham came to God. And said, God, the future redemption of the Jewish people, I want it to be in my merit. And God says, and what did you do? He says, me. <laughs> I, I waited a hundred years to have a son. And then when he was 37 years old, you told me to bring him as, a, as an offering, the binding of Isaac. I was ready to dedicate and commit everything that I had to you. Isaac comes to God and says, I want the future redemption of the Jewish people to be in my merit. And what did you do, Isaac? He says, when my father was bringing me as an offering, the binding of Isaac, that's me, right? He says, I was pulling the sword on me. I wanted to dedicate and show my commitment to you. And the same is with Jacob 
And Jacob says, I was by Lot, by my uncle. He was a cheat. He was a, he, he was a, 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 a shrewd businessman. He was dishonest with me. And I never lost my faith. And I never followed his ways. And notwithstanding all of the challenges, I stayed committed to you. Commitment. And Moses and Aaron and Joseph and all of the great legends of the Jewish people came and said, it should be in my merit. And Rachel interrupts. Rachel interrupts. And she says, God, the future redemption of the Jewish people should be in my merit. And what did you do, Rachel? Rachel says, I gave up my entire life, my entire future so that my sister won't be embarrassed. So that when her sister Leah was switched under the chuppah, under the canopy, and Jacob was going to ask, what's the, what's, what's the secret code? And she wasn't going to know. And she'd be humiliated. You see, she's a cheat. Or Lot was a cheat. The father was a cheat. And she'd be embarrassed. An amazing thing. She was ready to give up her entire life so that her sister not be embarrassed. Do you know what strength it takes for someone to be willing to give up their entire existence? Because she knew her father was a cheat. She knew that Jacob worked seven years to get her hand in marriage. And now finally comes the day, and her father was going to do a switcheroo. And she, for all she knew, was never going to be married to Jacob ever again. And she was ready to give it up for what? For her sister not to be embarrassed. God says to Rachel, Min i kolech mi bechi. You can stop crying. Because it is in your merit that your children will be redeemed. It is in your merit because dedication is not enough. Commitment is not enough. But someone who's ready to change who they are for someone else. Someone who's able to be selfless for someone else on such a high level. To be able to give up everything. I mean, think of it. Put yourself in Rachel's shoes. Put yourself in. Who? Seven years, you're excited. Your your betrothed is working the fields, working the, the, the flock so that he can marry you. What bride is not excited for the day of her wedding? And suddenly she sees, at the last moment, the father is going to do the switch. And she says, I'm, I'm ready to give it all up so that my sister not be embarrassed. That's not commitment or dedication. That's much more. God says it's in Rachel's merit. It's in Rachel. Such a great, that's our matriarch. Everything that we have today is from that greatness of one moment of Rachel's unbelievable selflessness. It's greater than Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Aaron and King David and King Solomon, everyone. Only Rachel. Because there's a difference between being committed and dedicated yeah, I'm a committed Jew. I'm dedicated. Versus, I'm willing to change my entire world for someone else. That is a level of perfection of character that hopefully we will be able to learn from our matriarch. Make that part of our lives. That we can be, when we walk and someone insults us, that we can still love them. And we can be gracious to them. And we can be kind to them. We'll see. We'll see. The, the, the traits of the human being are so marvelous and so incredible that we will see that we could be superhuman if we only were able to identify the traits that we have hiding within us. And we all have them. We all have unbelievable talents and unbelievable skills and unbelievable abilities that we don't even know. And with one little adjustment, one little change, even just identifying what those traits are, getting some type of 
uh, uh, markings in our journal. Today, I realized I was a little bit selfish. Best, by the way, to focus on our positive traits. I know we have a tendency to immediately talk about all of our negative traits. Right? Don't, don't go there. Focus on your positive traits. And it's okay. I remember we once asked my grandfather of blessed memory, we asked him, isn't it a little arrogant for me to think that I'm a kind person? Isn't it a little bit arrogant for me to think that I'm such a loving person? Isn't it a little arrogant? He says, it's fine. We'll get over it. Right now, you have to identify it. You have to identify it. So my recommendation would be this week to focus only on the positive traits. And if you notice during the day, you know what? I was patient with someone. I was kind. I was thoughtful. Mark it down. Identify your personal, your, your, your positive traits because we're, it's a journey. And you'll see those traits coming up again and again. But we have to uncover them. We have to unseal them because we've been thought for whatever reason. I don't know why. Human beings, we're all trained to think like, push it aside. I don't, I don't need to talk about my positive or and my negatives. Oh, ugh. I'm filled with negative traits, right? I'm filled with, I have so many things I want to fix. Let's not worry about our negative. We first need our positive. And it's not like a, a like a pep talk. Oh, be positive. Everybody be positive. Right? It's like, the, the, idea, the idea here is that we, we really are, we're filled with so many beautiful traits. And we're going to try to unlock them. We're going to try to unlock them. Now, I want to share with you one, one more story, and and then we'll unlock the, uh, the the mute. There was a woman who, during the Six Day War, was in the in the uh, bunker beneath the Mir Yeshiva. The Mir Yeshiva in Jerusalem was right on the border with Jordan. Right on the border with Jordan. And Six Day War, you know, was a miraculous war in that it was only six days. And that we were able to, uh, you know, gain control over Jerusalem, the West Bank. And it was really an unbelievable open miracle. But on the fifth day of the war, something happened. And Reb Chaim Shmulevitz the head of the Mir Yeshiva declared to his students, I just want you to know that tomorrow the war is ending. (laughs) What is he, a prophet? What did he know? I actually heard this from someone who was in the room when this incident happened. He says, the war is ending tomorrow. What happened? What happened that he knew that the war was ending the next day? So listen to this amazing story. There was a, this was the, the miklat, what do they call the miklat? The bunker, no, it's not the bunker, the, uh, the, uh, the bomb shelter, right? So the entire yeshiva was in the bomb shelter, but all of the neighboring buildings also evacuated from their homes into the bomb shelter of the yeshiva. It was a big bomb shelter, and everyone was there, in the, like, it's, it's like 30, 40 feet underground. It's still there today. They still have Torah classes being taught there today. And it really is, it, it, was, it was an incredible time. Everyone's hearing, you can hear the mortar shells. You can hear all of these different, uh, you know, rifles. You can hear it from the shelter. And this one woman, the, the, at a moment that the entire building shook, it was hit, the building was hit by a tank shell, and the entire building shook. This woman stood up and she said, I forgive my husband. She yelled it out. The rabbi heard that. He told the students immediately, the war is ending tomorrow. What's going on? What is the story? I'll tell you the amazing story. This woman's husband was an evil person. He walked out on her with her many children. One day, didn't show up. A second day, gone. 
over. They can't find him. They don't know where he is. He just walked out on them. And obviously, she was left with a very challenging life, having to raise her children herself, having to support her children herself. And this woman is what we call a, an aguna. An aguna is a woman who cannot marry anyone else. She can't even get married. It's like the worst case scenario. When this building was hit by that shell, she took it as an opportunity to shake up the heavens, to do something which she didn't need to do, to do something which no one in the world would ever ask her to do. She went beyond what she thought she was capable of. And she was able to forgive. No one would ever ask her to forgive. She doesn't need to. But she did something which was so great that it shook up the heavens. The rabbi, when he heard her yell and say, I forgive my husband, he said that tears up all the decrees. And the rabbi said, I'm telling you, the war will end tomorrow because of the merit of this woman, like the modern day Rachel. We're able to do so much with our, with our, within ourselves. We have the ability, we have the power to turn the entire world inside out with our traits, with our kindness, with our faith, with our love. We are able to really transform the entire world. That's what Musr is. Musr is maximizing every aspect of our life. Your husband, your wife, you can maximize every aspect of your life. You're a child, you're a parent, you can maximize every aspect of your life. You're a human being. Musr gives us the tools we need to maximize every aspect of our life. So my dear friends, this is just a, a short introduction into the world of Musa. And I look forward to learning more together. I look forward to growing together. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. I still have, sadly, four and a half pages of introduction. But uh, I, I look forward. We'll get to it. I promise we'll get to every, we'll get to all of it. But um, I, I really um, would like to hear your questions or comments. Uh, if anyone has any, um, I don't know if if uh, Mrs. Busco is able to un unlock the mute. Um, uh, everyone can everyone can unmute. Oh, perfect. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear it. Here. Thank you, Rabbi. It was oh, wonderful. Bobby. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Hi, Lauren. Thank right. you, Rabbi. This was amazing. I'm so sorry I didn't get to your class sooner. It was amazing. Thank you. You are hilarious. And I think I would love your father. I love you. I love your father. Y'all are, you are so funny. So Thank next you. time I won't be making biscuits. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Have Thank a good you. night. Have a good night. Thank you. And any any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Anna, Rabbi go for it. Um can you tell me what verses that you quoted from Proverbs and from Leviticus? Definitely. Proverbs chapter 4, 13. Thank you. And Leviticus, this is off my memory. Oh, I'll open up a Chumash right here. Thank you. Okay, any other question meanwhile? Rabbi? Yes. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your your Parsha podcast every week. They're fascinating. <clears throat> oh, well, that, that's my brother, but thank you. Well, that's your brother. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, well, how do you counter negative traits as they occur in real time? I guess you've spoken about focusing your, on your positive, on, on the good things about yourself to eventually fortify yourself to address the negative things. But in real time, in our lives, on an everyday basis, 
most of us are, you know, that most of our of us are setting forth negative aspects of our of our personalities. So I'm I'm interested, and I don't think you can do this probably at the first session, but I would be interested in how in in real time to reverse the the the, the, the sure. tables because we know what we've done isn't right. Okay, so it's an excellent question. I I, I would love to to answer it. It's going to be a little bit. Uh, um, okay, let, let me let me explain. Okay, let's say, let's say that I um, am plagued with anger. Okay, so I definitely cannot fix anger uh, if I don't know that it exists in my life. If it's not in my tool in my in my tool chest, right, of negative traits, I won't I won't know to work on it. Most likely, and unless I don't have someone who I love and that loves me that I would respect and accept their their uh, their uh, criticism, I probably won't be able to work on it appropriately. However, once I do know that it exists, I can start thinking, when does it manifest itself? And I can I can start identifying triggers. I can start identifying triggers. I'll give you an example. My rabbi, uh, you know, anybody here from Israel or anybody who's been in Israel, um, knows that taking a cab in Israel is a very stressful experience because the cab driver will change the price 10 times in the process of the ride. Oh my God. Okay. He'll tell you it's 40 shekel, then it's 50 shekel, then it's 20 shekel, then it's 80 shekel. <laughs> At the end of the day, you end up paying more than he ever told you. Always. Okay. That's almost always the case. And it's infuriating. It's infuriating, particularly to Americans, because Israelis know how to avoid it. But Americans feel taken advantage of. So my rabbi would always give this as an example. He said, if you don't prepare yourself for it, you will fall every time. So you have to say, and this is what he, this was the, the example he gave about himself. Where he said, before he goes into a cab, he says, what's the maximum I'm willing to pay to not get angry? <laughs> And he would prepare himself like that, right? I'm willing to pay 50 shekel, right, to not get angry. Okay, so now if it's 30, I save 20 and I'm, I feel good, right? And if it's, you, you understand what I'm saying? Is that if we've done it, if we're not able to identify where it is that we fall, we'll never be able to fix it. Now, once we identify that it exists and we're able to identify scenarios in which it's most challenging, then what we're doing is we're putting ourselves in a, in, in a, in a, preparation mode so that we can um, further identify other areas in which it can come up without us being ready. And the truth is that that's the trick. The trick is to first identify. Once we identify, we can start pinpointing specific areas that trigger that anger or whatever the negative trait is. And then we can either avoid such situations. So if you know, for example, that the cab ride is such an angry, uh, angry experience, an anger filled experience, then you can either avoid taking cabs or you can just um, prepare yourself so that you don't get triggered by it. OK, so it's a very good question. And it's one that I hope we'll be able to address many, many more times throughout the, the entire course. Mark, Mark Schneider. Rabbi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you. I want it. I want. I. I'm curious to know your thoughts or everybody's thoughts, uh, but most specifically your thoughts here. Uh, I listened into a share, uh, and uh, I can't recall the source, but the rabbi said that all love is ultimately rooted in rage. So I, I, I'm just curious to know, like, what your thoughts are on that, and how that ties into, you know, some of the comments you were talking about with regards to love. So I, I have a policy that I, I have a policy that I don't comment on other rabbis statements. So, but we're, we're going to talk about love. So, um, you know, I'm sure he meant it in a specific, in a specific way. Um, but, uh, um, we're going to talk about love. Love is very, very important and to make sure that love is pure and to make sure that love is, uh, is elevating. Yes. The recording will be available, Wendy. And uh, the worksheets, if you just leave your emails in the chat box, we'll be able to identify, we'll be able to email you. Ellie Sofer, go for it. Okay, my question is, I have two questions. Um, I'll start with one. Uh, you, you mentioned that the goal is perfection, which implies a completion point. 
if we were to define what is perfect, can we get like a full list of traits which we can work on? Or, or I guess, can we define what it would mean to be completely perfect? Right. Okay. So the, I would say the point of perfection is the closest we can possibly be to the Almighty. Okay. okay. Not in being the Almighty, but rather being closest we could be towards connecting with the Almighty. Uh, that that's that that would be in in a, in a short uh, short response, but uh, the the destination is different for each individual, because every person is born with a different set of tools, every person is born with a different set of challenges, right? So one person could have grown up with a family with with siblings. With, with parents that are one way and relatives and, and schools and friends and influences and communities. And another one could have grown up in a completely different, with a completely different set of structure. Each one's destiny is going to be very, very different. Each can find their own perfection. It means it's not the same. It, it, it's, it's not like a, a, a cookie cutter. Everyone's got to be the same thing. No. Everyone's unique. I don't want any. Nobody should end up like me, and I shouldn't end up like anyone else. You should be the greatest you, and every person here should be the greatest version of themselves. You, you understand? So it's we can't put like, oh, if you follow A B C D E F G, then you will end up, you know, looking like that. No, you have to be the 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 best Ellie or Eli that's out there. I understand. Okay. What's the second question? Uh, I guess it kind of flows in well. If our purpose is to never stop working on our traits, then what's what's the purpose of having like a mission or, or a goal? Because because any direction that your life goes, we can continuously work on our traits. So is there a purpose to kind of like drive your life or should you be reactionary and kind of focus inward on your traits as you go through life? Do you understand that's the question? Uh, yeah, that, it's a good question. I, I want to think about that, if you, if you don't mind. I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, sure. I, I'd love to think about it and 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 get back to you. Maybe next week I'll have I'll have a chance right. to, uh, to to address that. Okay. No, it's a great question. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Volby. Rabbi Yaakov Volby, you want to share some wisdom? The legend, he's with us. Uh, you're a hard act to follow. I'm just enjoying it all. <laughs> Great to see everyone, uh, new friends and old friends. I'm just, I, if I knew I'll be on camera, I wouldn't, uh, I would have sent the kids out. So I apologize for that. But uh, no, thank you so much. And it's great to see everyone. And this was amazing. Your kids are beautiful. Uh, your, kid, your kids are, are, are part of your beauty. Absolutely. Yes. yes, thank you. Thank so God they got their looks from, from, uh, from my wife. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Rabbi Yaakov, for putting this all together. Any other questions? Nope. Rabbi Wolby, will you be sending out the list of hundreds of midot? Yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, I'll keep you busy for a long time. Uh, yeah, the 330 negative and the 221 positive. Absolutely. Uh, I'll send that out to everyone on the list. Um, and everyone is welcome to email me if you have any questions throughout the week. Uh, my email is awolbe at torchweb.org. That's A-W-O-L-B-E at T-O-R-C-H-W-E-B dot O-R-G. All right, everybody. Have a terrific evening, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I look forward thank to you, seeing Rabbi you Aaron, Good to see you. Thank you, good Rabbi. To, good to see you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good week. Dear Rabbi, there's some questions here. Go for it. You gave us the definition of Musa, but what is the, it's a Hebrew word, what is the translation? That's a good question. Um, one second here. Uh, 